Ah, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm here. I'm back. Uh, tell you guys, I wanted to be back yesterday here, but too much happening. Uh, so I had a good rest. Uh, just been focusing on the Lord and reading material and looking at material. And I was given a message Friday night, Friday night from Daniel 6, Daniel 6. So we're going to be going over Daniel 6 today, people. And Daniel is very, very, and he should be very, very encouraging to you what he went through. And so that's why I have my safari, safari hat on today. Because we're going to see the lions. We're going to see the lions. And we're going to go back a few centuries back and see what Daniel did, okay, to avoid the lions eating him alive. And I'm just telling you, it's time to stand like a Daniel, be like a Daniel, dare to be a Daniel, as a lot of people say. And so we're going to get into Daniel today, Daniel 6. I'm going to get into dreams. I got dreams to share with you from Latter Rain 333. And another lady uh, uh, that I know over in Louisiana had a dream. I'm going to be sharing that just from what she told me on her chat. Uh, very brief, but very powerful because we know we are at war. War is at the making. Uh, Lewis from Florida was talking about all kinds of things yesterday. I didn't get to go over all his material about war, about things going on in California. A lot of things are happening. Uh, we're going to go over here and look at some Israel news real brief uh, and maybe show a little bit of this clip I got from Israel uh, over there from Israel 7 News. They're doing a, a, a program and they're talking about the feast. Okay, just a little bit about the feast. So I'm probably going to just show a very little bit of that video. And then we're going to get over to Moriel. He's talking about a video that I shared with a lot of people last night uh, about 9-11, uh, where we are now and where we uh, have come from and where we're going. So it's a very powerful video. It's about an hour long. I'm not going to show the whole thing, just a little intro, a little intro of it, okay? Well, maybe it can um, saturate your, you know, your mind to go look at the rest of it. But uh, I'm telling you, babe, uh, people, wow, these are the days. These are the days. These are the days of Elijah. These are definitely the days of the prophets. So we're going to be going through all this today. Uh, uh, Daniel is very important, and the dreams are very important. And, um, and so Daniel had a dream. That's why I'm going to be showing this, but... He had a dream, uh, and I think I have it down in my description box somewhere. He had a dream, okay, about all these kingdoms rising and falling in the second coming of Yeshua HaMashiach. And so that's why we got to get into this. This is Daniel here, uh, 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 Daniel here, picture here, Daniel. Uh, so, you know, we, we are in the end at the end. Nobody want to believe it. I don't think nobody really believe it. A lot of people just don't want to believe it. But the time is running out. All oh, right before us, the time is running out, people. So let's get on over here. Uh, go through the fair use notice real quick. I'm going to have my husband come and join me with Daniel today. Just so much to go on there. But three important things coming from Daniel I got to really emphasize on. So let me go here now and play my friend Mia. I'm going to get to her song again kind of relating to those times of trouble back in the day when people said uh, Pharaoh was distressing the people, distressing the land, let my people go, and that's like we're going back to that time. I don't know, people. We're in the feast time. Uh, I told you the other day I was here for Amos 8, and I'm telling you, Amos 8, it, it just seemed like it's repeating itself. I don't know. We're in a feast time. I don't know if we're going to have darkness come over the land. I don't know what can happen. We don't know if we're going in the wilderness. I don't know what can occur. We're just going to have to keep trusting the Messiah, Yeshua. Keep trusting him, people. So let me go ahead now and get on over to uh, this song and get into the news and some other little things here. And uh, I will put a lot of things in the description box. I knew I was just looking at Apostolic D. I haven't heard from him in a while. And I was just looking at some of his material. So I will put, put, post a few of his links in the description box, okay? Important links that he's talking about stuff. So uh, but let me go ahead and, and get all over here to this song. Let me go ahead and mute it out. Uh, microphone's on correctly. Let me go ahead and mute this out right now.
Pray for everyone that we could all feel joy. And I am peace. asking for prayer for my family. I would like family. to ask prayer for the unity between different congregations. Pray with me uh, for my uh, nation. We pray for successful operations. Please pray. It will be a safe journey. We pray for their well-being. I'm Monica Yagori, and I encourage you to pray for each other.
And I'm Yair Pinto, and I would like to invite you to join us here in Jerusalem in prayer from around the world. Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Praise. I'm Yair Pinto, and today we have a very special guest. We have Adam Gabelli, Pastor Adam Gabelli from Vancouver, Canada. How are you doing? Shalom, everyone. It's an honor to be with you today, all the way from Vancouver, the west coast of Canada. Yes, and this is really exciting because it's the first time we have a guest on Skype from a different continent, and we believe that the God will really bless this program with you here in the studio with us in Jerusalem. Amen. And another guest, uh, or guest, uh, not my co-host, Monica <laughs> Yagori, as always. It's good to have you. Thank you. Good to be here. <laughs> And as usual, as always, we want to start with a prayer that God will be with us. So, Monica, could you please lead us in, in prayer today? Yes, Abba Father, we just thank you again for another opportunity to come together in your name, Lord, and, and glorify you. And we thank you that uh, where two or three are together in your name, uh, you will be in the midst of them. You have promised to be with us, never leave us, never forsake us. And uh, we thank you for your faithfulness today, Lord. And uh, we praise, praise you, glorify you, and uh, we uh, ask for your leading, for your guidance, for your wisdom. We pray that you'd make our tongues as pens of ready writers, mm -hmm. and that uh, our meditations may be pleasing unto you today, Lord, and uh, glorify you, and that your plan, your will be done, as in heaven, so on earth, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Monica and Adam, today we have a, a very exciting topic. You know, just last week we celebrated here in Israel and all over the world, the Feast of Trumpets. And we discussed a little bit the meaning of the Feast of Trumpets on, um, <clears throat> on our Editor's Note program. The Feast of Trumpets has a really cool meaning. And I really like God because He is such a practical God. He knows that we as humans forget, that we need reminders. And He loves us like a father and He keeps reminding us. So the Feast of Trumpets is a reminder, a wake up call for us to repent, to soul search, and to get back to our roots, to get back to our roots, to the biblical roots, and to be uh, clean between us and God and between us and the people around us. And now this week we have uh, another very important holiday. We have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And in this, uh, <clears throat> in this holiday, basically we conclude our soul searching and back in the, in, the ancient, uh, in the ancient days when the, the temple stood, we had the, feast, uh, the, the priest, the high priest, going inside the temple. And after the whole nation uh, soul searched and repented, he goes into the holiest place of the, of the temple and sacrifices a lamb for the entire nation of Israel. And if... Uh, he and the entire country are without sin, then God basically welcomes them into his uh, presence and then they celebrate in the Feast of Tabernacles, which is coming up next. So it's such a beautiful, you know, example and, uh, you know, a way for us, even these days when we don't have the temple, to remember that God always wants us and this circle of him calling for us to repent and then wanting to be close to us without our sin. So it's, it's really beautiful. But I want to start by asking Adam to share a little bit where you're from, Adam, and, and uh, what are you doing? Well, again, uh, Yair, Monica, it's a real honor to be with you here for Jerusalem Praise. Um, I am coming to you right from Canada, actually, right now. And um, it's a, it's a 10 hour difference, so I'm 10 hours behind everyone in Jerusalem, and boy, does my heart long to be with you all there. Um, uh, so I, it's an honor for me to be here. I, I've been involved with Israel ministry uh, since I was a little boy. Um, I, I do uh, my on my mother's side they're Italian, and on my father's side they're Italian Jews. So we have this uh, two worlds that come together. Uh, but they immigrated to Canada when they were young, and I was born in this nation of Canada. So I, I'm also a, a minister with the uh, Assemblies of God here, a, a pastor at a church on the West Coast. 
And I'm also involved uh, with the International Christian Embassy of Jerusalem. I'm the deputy director for the Canadian branch. So um, it, again, it's such an honor to discuss this high holy day, mm -hmm. Yom HaKadosh, the most holy day, right? In, in yes. all of the biblical calendar that God set apart for uh, his people. So it's really a joy to be able to divulge and discuss this day. Yeah, and you know, this, this day is also very important for us in the show because this is Jerusalem praise. And we believe in the power of prayer and that God answers and listens to our prayer if we pray according to his will. And Amen. prayer is a big part of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Right, Monica? The, maybe you can share a little bit what the, the people of Israel are doing in Israel during, during this day, Yom Kippur. Well, um, actually, um, in some way, the soul searching uh, started already uh, in the beginning of the month of Elul, mm -hmm. so uh, in the beginning of last month. And then uh, in the month of Elul, they uh, read every morning uh, uh, Psalm 27, which is very special. We're not going to read it now, but you can look it up at homes. And also they blow the shofar every morning. So they're calling already. Uh, it's, it's about a 40-day uh, mm -hmm. soul searching, actually. It starts in, uh, already in Elul. And, and so um, uh, half of my weeks, I, I stay um, close to the old city and close to the Kotel, uh, somewhere around the City of David area. So I hear them. Mm -hmm. I hear the, them blowing the shofars, and also it's something called selichot. The Jewish people uh, uh, do the repentance prayers and, and forgiveness prayers at, at the Kotel, mm -hmm. and then very often like large crowds go there. Uh, these days uh, the crowds are not so large, but you can still hear it's happening, and then people are very aware of what's going on, and, and so they're doing it very seriously. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so let's, I think that's, it's a good time to look at what basically... Uh, the Bible says about Yom Kippur. Mm. Okay, so maybe I will go to uh, Leviticus 23, verse 26 to 32, and I will read it in Hebrew, mm -hmm. and then uh, Monica, if you could please read it in English. Vayedaber Adonai el Moshe le'emor Ach ba'asor lechodesh ha'shvi'i haze Yom HaKippurim hu Mikra kodesh yelechem ועיניתם את נפשותיכם, והקרבתם אישה לאדוני, וכל מלאכה לא תעשו בעצם היום הזה, כי יום הכיפורים הוא לכפר עליכם לפני אדוני אלוהיכם. כי כל הנפש אשר לא תאונה בעצם היום הזה, ונכרתה מעמיה, וכל הנפש אשר תעשה כל מלאכה בעצם היום הזה, והעבדתי את הנפש ההוא מקרב אימה. כל מלאכה לא תעשו. חוקת עולם לדורכם בכל משבותיכם. שבת שבתון הוא לכם, ועיניתם את נפשותיכם בתשעה לחודש בערב מערב עד תשבתו שבתכם. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person will destroy, will be destroyed from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be to, your uh, to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls. On the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Amen. Okay, guys, I just wanted to bring that out because uh, we are celebrating the feast and uh, a lot of people are different dates and all that too. But, you know, we're going to be celebrating the 17th coming up this weekend on uh, the 17th on Shabbat. But uh, and then I heard my brothers in Hebrew over in Nigeria doing it on the 22nd. Different people have different times, but I don't know. I It's just a wonderful thing to take part of. If you don't know anything about it, everybody be asking about the feast all the time. But... You know, like I said, if you really go and study the Bible, you know that Sunday is the first day of the week. It's not the day God designed uh, for us to uh, worship uh, on. Uh, he set aside that day and sanctified it. 
and the feasts go along with it, people. Uh, it was a memorial. We're supposed to be doing them as a memorial uh, to what Yeshua told us back in the times of Egypt, back in the time of Exodus. You saw I was just showing Moses, but we you know nothing has really changed. He just became our great atonement. He was our great atonement. Yeshua HaMashiach, he became our living sacrifice. We didn't need sheeps and goats and all these things anymore. We don't need to be going through that anymore, thank God. But uh, a lot of people are getting it all confused. But we don't. We got one, one person that made the great sacrifice for all sin, and it's Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. So we need to understand how important it is to keep his feasts and not the worldly feast. all these worldly things we do, Easter, uh, Christ, Christmas, and all these things people do. But if you go and really study, you'll know it's not nothing to do with Yeshua. Uh, you need to be following his feast, his feast, okay? So I just thought I would throw that out in the other day because we are in the feast season of the fall of the year, the fall, the fall feast. Uh, so uh, let me go ahead and go on over here to some other material. Going to get through some new, a uh, few news clippings, and then I'm going to get into uh, a video. I really want to play just a 10 minute of it uh, coming from uh, Mariel uh, Jacob. Uh, he just has something he's talking about 9 11. Uh, I'm just going to do an intro of it and let you hear the rest, and you can go hear the rest of this video as well. All these things will be posted in the description box, okay? So let me go ahead and mute out again. Just wanted to explain that to you guys. Okay. Mute out. 21. Guys, you're looking at the uh, newest updates from the National Hurricane Center. We have Tropical Storm Nicholas down in the southern Gulf coming out of the Bay of Campeche. 40 mile per hour winds moving north at 13 miles an hour. Looks like a Texas event according to the model. We're also going to look at the system that's off the Bahamas. 50% chance of development and uh, it's, they're pointing out that it's southeast of the Carolinas. And uh, they have a reason for that, but notice the cone uh, headed up towards North Carolina there. But here's the current information. As of 7 a.m., this thing's going to be getting closer to the shore of northeastern Mexico. Tomorrow, 7 p.m., starting to skate the uh, coast of Texas. The blue lines are tropical storm warnings. The yellow lines are tropical storm watches. Notice it's 7 p.m. Monday again, starting to uh, skate the coast. But by 7 a.m. Tuesday morning, it's coming ashore in the central Texas area. It looks like that would be southeast of Houston, around maybe just uh, in the Bay City area, possibly. Remaining a tropical storm as it comes ashore. Again, there's your tropical storm warnings out now. That's going to change, guys. That blue line will keep moving up the Texas coast. And uh, this thing will affect um, either more of Texas, parts of Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana who needs it the least. And that white cone is expanded out at the top. You notice the dots in it. That's the four or five day prediction there. Then your three day prediction is in the white area. So we can't take our eyes off of it, Louisiana, yet. Now, here's the local uh, satellite images. If you look through the tops of the storm clouds and look at the surface area, and I'll pull this up, we can get a better look at it. You can see there's a pretty good rotation there telling us that we've had a, um, a lot of energy involved. And you can see how disorganized the showers are right now across the Gulf, but it's indicating a tremendous amount of moisture. That's going to be important, especially for Louisiana. Now, if, again, looking through the top clouds, notice the surface, and you will see that rotation. Out into the central Atlantic, approaching the Bahamas. We talked about this last night. It's been uh, moving in there for a couple days, but it's now starting to pick up some clouds around it, some storms and rain, and uh, they're talking about possibly a Carolina event on this one for all my friends there, close up uh, in Caribbean satellite. Notice that it is starting to pick up some moisture, and it will continue to do that throughout the day because it's close to Haiti and Puerto Rico and those islands, and they w themselves would generate storms as in the heat of the day, just the way Florida will do. But it has a 50% chance of development. The uh, gradual development of the system is possible, and the tropical depression could form later this week several hundred miles southeast of the Carolinas while it moves northwestward across the western Atlantic. You can see that cone. So again, if it remains that way, you're going to have some type of impact 
possibly a front could come off the uh, U.S. coast and keep it offshore. That would be our best bet. But we got to watch it. You know how these things work. That's what this is. What we're looking at right now with that storm. You've got one coming off the coast of Africa, and the one that um, is just north of there in the yellow is down to a 20% chance of development. It was very high, but the one below it that's coming off of Africa, further south, 60% chance of development in the next few days. And I mentioned that the one just above it that's in the yellow X was a little further north to maintain a westwardly pattern, and as it moves north, it's going to be in cooler water. This is an overall look at the U.S. This afternoon, I'm going to do an update on the wildfire situation, but notice again, the storm is taking over the weather along the coastal sections or the Gulf coastal sections of the U.S., clearing that smoke back out. It's a blessing, but it is concentrating it somewhat uh, north of us because you've got it still trying to push south and... um, Nicholas is pushing it back north. The skies outside here in central Mississippi are blue again, unlike uh, in the video that I mentioned yesterday that um, the skies were yellow, and uh, you could it was you could taste and smell the smoke. But anyway, guys, I wanted to get in here, let you know what Nicholas is doing, and we'll watch for the updates. There are uh, they are flying the Hurricane Hunter out if they haven't already done it. It was scheduled for this morning. It may have already, um, the information may have already come in. We'll check the updates, guys. You watch it. We're watching it. It's a heads up. Be safe. Louis, today is September 11, 2021, and welcome to the Grand Supreme News Channel. Before I start, guys, give this video a big thumbs up and share this video. I want to show you the title to this article. Now, check this out. Container ship congestion at Los Angeles ports hits record high as more ships join queue. Now, this is big, guys. This is leading to a massive shortage of in various places there is a lot of containers out there in los angeles look at this and the numbers are rising now they are again they're just leaving these containers out there and go figure why everything's completely empty in certain aisles uh i talked about georgia right i travel i went to 10 different states and i seen massive shortages i seen target um in the state of Georgia, right? Almost half of the store empty. I'm like, what's going on here? No shampoo, no soap. I mean, I'm like, man, it's it, it just getting really bad. They have signs saying due to shortages and this and that. I mean, what if this is going to be for us? I mean, what if, you know, the shortages, because I do believe that there's still some stuff left, but eventually it's going to take time for the shelf to be completely 100% empty. And once that's that comes, then people's going to start crying out saying, hey, we want food. We want things. And then those in power is going to be like, well, we could give you all that. All you got to do is take the juice. We got the ship in the, in the ports and out there in Los Angeles. All you got to do is take the juice. We got a lot of you know stuff in there. You want shampoo and stuff? So here, look. Let me just read the comments because even people look. I've been talking about this, and you know, I just you know, want, look. I want people to be prepared because this is going to lead to something much more bigger. All part of the plan. Shortages are coming, so prepare. They are so easy to read if you take a step back and get your head out of the blank box that is programming many of you every night. If you believe what the TV, this person sounds like me, but it's again, it's not me though. If you believe what the TV talking heads are saying, then you are basically lost. And that goes for Fox as well. This person responded. Shortages are already here. I've been seeing them in grocery stores for over a month now. Laundry detergent. Three local Walmart stores were wiped completely out. 
bottle, non-alcoholic beverages, bread, and other foodstuffs, things like hamburger, have nearly doubled in price. I'm also seeing it's in over-the-counter, and I'm not going to say that name right there, guys. And I am now starting to see it in auto-related items. This is why I'm telling you guys in my live stream, the last one, don't sell your car. Keep your car. If, it, if it's not running, keep it. They want vehicles because there is a massive chip shortage. So even dealership, right? I remember taking a car, right? A 1999 Honda Civic Coupe. Nice, man. You know, I wanted to use it for like a down payment. So they looked at it, right? It had like 125,000 miles. It was a stick ship, right? It was not the EM1. It was just a regular one and stuff like that. So they was like, we could give you $200 for it. $200. This thing is running, man. It's 125,000 miles. It's never been in an accident. And you... you you want to give me $200 for the car? Well, again, you know, that's how much we're going to offer you. <laughs> Dealership nowadays, since there's a chip shortage, they want to give you up to like $1,000 for a junky car that doesn't run. It sounds like a lot of money. See, free money all over the place. You want money? Money. More money. Here's the thing, guys. Hold on to the things that you have because the prices are going up and your car Value is also going to go up. All right. So it says here, and I now starting to see it in auto related items. Local new car dealerships and auto parts stores are having a hard time getting things like engine oil. Not because the base oil is unavailable, but because the additive package which goes into the oil is becoming unavailable. So, Start stocking, I mean, start stocking up on oil. That's uh, very important. You need oil change and stuff like that. So one local dealer told me this week that it's becoming very difficult to get 55-gallon drums of bulk oil for his oil and filter quick change service. The shortages will matter only when the public starts to, you know what, about it. So they're keeping the containers out there. They're keeping those containers out there. Indeed, they already are here. I do not know about the United States since I live in France, but shelves are more and more scarce. Most people do not pay attention when you look closely to the shelves behind the facing on shelves. There is not so much products left behind. Bills for pretty much everything go sky high around here. Inflation is already here. When people will understand, when will people understand these shortages? With only grew in time, it will trigger a reaction from people to hoard items like food and other products. This will trigger more shortages and an inflation spiral that will get out of control rapidly. All of this is done on purpose. It is deliberate. Surely, this will later lead to a huge event. Panic, mass hysteria, and all these type of lawless stuff. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash. If you're watching, catching up, you know that already. But it is, of course, September 11th today, September 11th, 911, 20 years later. I recall coming back on the last flight from Chicago to London, arriving on the morning of September 11th. I got to Heathrow Airport. I was on my way to catch a connecting flight to. Leeds in the north of England, where I lived at the time in Yorkshire, but I'd come in from Chicago, last flight across the Atlantic from Chicago, before all flights were grounded, except military flights. And I found out what happened. I immediately 
contacted family in New York for the simple reason I had family who worked in the Twin Towers. My sister's husband, Keith, the father of my niece, Rhiannon, and the husband of my sister. I'd been in the Twin Towers many times. I've worked in it for brief periods. I had been there on other business. I remember taking my children to the roof to the observatory when we were on a family holiday visiting my American relatives from Britain. My family, of course, is Israeli, but we lived in Britain at the time. I had just gotten out of seminary and we were over there and I took my kids to the, see the Twin Towers, but I'd been in them many times. I watched the bicentennial, the parade of sailing ships with, with tall masks and, and so forth, uh, and various schooners and things and brigantines from one of the elevated floors of, of, of the uh, World Trade Center, the Twin Towers for the Bicentennial of the United States. I had many memories of that place, many. And I remember when it was being built. Now, most of my life before immigrating to Israel and living in Britain, although I spent varying periods of time abroad, I lived either in New Jersey near the Statue of Liberty, directly, almost directly opposite Lower Manhattan where the Twin Towers were. I was lived in New Jersey, but just opposite Lower Manhattan, almost like a sixth borough. I lived near near the Statue of Liberty. Um, the Statue of Liberty is closer to New Jersey than it is to New York. Uh, and I lived, that's where I lived, that area. But then I lived, of course, in Manhattan. I lived various places in Manhattan, in Midtown and in Greenwich Village at different points of my youth. So we're talking about my hometown and I remember watching the World Trade Center being built. I recall it very, very well. Uh, and I can't ex explain the devastation my family felt when my sister's husband was missing. I had done later co conferences with the late Tim LaHaye. He was a nice man, he was a friend of mine I didn't agree with his pre-tribulational position, nor did he agree with mine, but he was a nice man and we were friends and we did some conferences together, uh, mainly in the Western United States. We got on <clears throat> and although I'm not a fan of the theology of his book series, Left Behind, I found that my sister's husband had been reading that book by Tim LaHaye at the time he was killed. And he told my sister that he could no longer consider himself a Roman Catholic for various other reasons, but that he, this is Irish Catholic background, his name was Keith O'Connor, but that he would be reading Left Behind and it would appear that he came to faith in Jesus very shortly before he was murdered um, by radical Islam in my hometown. Before that, I had, of course, lived a number of years in Israel where my children were born. Uh, I did a very, very short bit of training in the Israeli military, but I lived there. And my wife, of course, had grown up there from the age of 11. Her parents were Holocaust survivors who came from Eastern Europe. Most of the family was killed in the Holocaust. And I lived in the shadow of Islamic terror. I saw what happened when the Muslims threw hand grenades into a toy store near where we lived in Haifa, uh, targeting children. Uh, and it was a store where my wife would take my children when they were babies to, to buy things, to buy children's toys and things like this. Uh, my son was an infant. My daughter was maybe two years old and they threw hand grenades in. Fortunately, my family was not in there at the time, but they could have been. I recall another time being in Jerusalem on Jaffa Road and, and I lived in Jerusalem for some time. And for 10 years, uh, well, I'm sorry, for 10 years off and on, I saw what was happening. And I'd been on Jaffa Road and maybe a quarter of an hour later at most, I was in a restaurant nearby where 
there's a Jewish guy from South Africa who ran it, name was Stan. And I used to witness to him, but he had a lot of customers who were believers and we used to share the gospel to him. He was quite open to it. And he was appreciative of Christian Zionists and things like that. But I would talk to him, I was a big friend of him. I'd spend a lot of time in South Africa and you know, I would talk to him about South Africa. I was friendly with him and I would try to get the gospel to him. And then bang. Right where I had just been maybe 12, 15 minutes sooner, a bomb goes off on a bus killing 17 people. Had it been 12, 15 minutes sooner, I could have been dead. The bus was just blown to bits, suicide bomber. I'd seen these things and I've been to a number of Muslim countries. I've been from Muslim countries from the Far East, through Asia to the Middle East, all the way to North Africa, Morocco on the Atlantic coast, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, across the Indian Ocean. I mean, I've been to Morocco, I've been to Egypt, I've been to Turkey, you know, I've been to Saudi Arabia, I've been to the Emirates, I've been to Brunei, I've been to Malaysia many times. I've been to a lot of Muslims, to Jordan, I've been to many Muslim countries, even Saudi Arabia. And I saw what it was, both the Arab and non-Arab versions. I've seen it in Africa. And everywhere I went, I saw the same thing. Persecution of Christians, a hatred of Israel and the Jews, and a resentment of the West. The same people who would come to England as immigrants even illegal immigrants, or come to Europe and demand jihad and, and, and proclaim Islam and want to hang, hang Salman Rushdie for writing a book in Great Britain and who would engage in the Bradford riots, did everything they could to get out of the Muslim world and wouldn't want to go back there. They want to come to a country they hate on behalf of a religion and culture that they say they love, yet they all want to get away from it. The week before last, I watched people from Afghanistan trying to get on airplanes. Very few of them worked as interpreters for the British or American military or for NATO. Very few. Most of them just wanted to come to Europe, to Germany, to go on welfare on the dole. The mentality of these people, if you understand it, you see it in France, you see it in many places, certainly Britain, is the following. I'll take a country like Denmark. 4% Muslim population, 4%. Well, 70% of the convicted rapists are Muslim. 90% of their victims are Danish. Although they're 4% of the population, 40% of the people on welfare, on dole, are Muslim. What's happened to certain cities like Rotterdam and Birmingham, England, and Bradford, England, and, and uh, certain cities like Malmo and, and Sweden is unbelievable. I've seen it. I've seen World War II veterans from D-Day being beaten up by Muslim gangs for walking through a Muslim neighborhood. I've seen politicians protecting Muslim gangsters who were pimps, pimping off virtual sexual slavery, underage English girls in a city called Rotherham. And for political reasons, it was played down. Police were pressured to say nothing. I've seen this all over the world, all over. Same story, same things. Now, when I was in the tourism business, uh, it was a little bit complicated. It was, I was hired to lead tours because of my background expertise, lingual ability. I was hired by tour companies to lead tours, 
but I made an agreement where I could video record the tours and donate the money to Moriel. So it was a way to make, make profit to subsidize our ministry in its earlier years and, uh, and gain income for myself because Moriel was very much struggling then and my own business in other things had not yet developed much. So I, I did these tours and <clears throat> I had to do business uh, on a fairly high level, not the top level, but a fairly high level in Egypt and Turkey and other Muslim countries, Jordan. And I met with westernized Muslim business people who <clears throat> seemed to be like any other business people that you'd meet in New York or Chicago or London or Sydney. They didn't seem to be odd or strange. They were moderates. I've seen moderate Muslims. I had a friend named Issam Hamdi in university who was a moderate Muslim. But I also had a friend in Bible college, Dr. Rahmatullah Khan, who graduated al Hazira University in Cairo, who was murdered and hacked to death by a Muslim gang in Pakistan. I'm not saying all Muslims are parasites, that all Muslims are terrorists. What I am saying is the following. According to Simon Weisenthal, no more and probably less than 15% of Germans were Nazis. But for certain social and economic and political reasons, the majority of Germans went along with Hitler and he came to power through coalition politics, through making a coalition with the Roman Catholic party of Bavaria, the Zentrum, led by Hans von Papen. Yet only 15%, probably less of Germans were real Nazis. the percentage proportion of Muslims who believe in jihad and believe in Sharia law and believe in enforcing it on others is much, much higher than that. I recall after the September 11th attacks, after I had just walked, because there was no remains to bury in the procession for my brother-in-law, that the New York Times published a report that said 68% of Muslims agreed the attack on New York and Washington was justified. They said they would all do it, but they all went with it. It is the minority of Muslims who are civilized. It's the minority. I'm not saying there are not civilized Muslims, but I know what I've seen. Of the 52 Muslim countries in the world, as I've said many times, not a one of them, not a single one, will give the rights to Christians or Jews that they get in Israel or that they get in Great Britain, or that they get in Australia, or that they get in Canada, or that they get in New Zealand, or that they get in the United States, or that they get in Holland, or that they get in France, or that they get anywhere. Not one. They have rights you don't. Including the right of demitude, the jizra. They believe that the infidel should have to pay a penalty tax to the Muslim for not being a Muslim. You can call it welfare or dull. To them, it's demitude. It is right. It is their religious teaching that the non-Muslim has to pay them for not being a Muslim as a penalty tax. This is the mentality.
Okay, people, I'm going to stop there. Uh, you can go and continue listening to this. Just see, it's an hour long. I cannot play the 54 minute. I uh, just wanted to get a little bit of it and let you know this was out yesterday. And, you know, another video, um, I'm really beginning to enjoy his teachings and his uh, his political, uh, Hebrew, whatever. You know, I just like his teachings. So uh, he did one on the Days of Awe that we saw yesterday, hour and four minutes. Uh, you can go and also watch that. I think you will get a lot out of it. Okay. So I will leave it in the description box and uh, you can continue watching that one. I'm going to go on over here quickly because the time is going. I'm going over here to dreams right now, really quick, about four minutes or so. And we're going to get into the Bible because that's what I really want to do. This video, I should have just did a whole see, a video on just Daniel alone. But I'm going to go ahead and just do this. Let me get this slide over some. Um, I'm going to play this short dream by, uh, uh, you see it's four minutes and 56 seconds by um Lot of rain, three, 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 I think. And then I'm going to get into, I'm going to just show you a short dream right now from Tina from Louisiana. I was trying to find it on my video, but I can't do that, dig it up right now. But I know that's what she precisely said was she had a dream and war was coming. And they was coming at her door, they at her apartment door. These soldiers or these people was coming at her door. So she did have a dream about that this weekend. I think she told me Friday, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Tina, about that. But uh, I know we a lot of people are having dreams, okay, of attacks and things coming. Uh, I have my own dreams, okay. But I just know that uh, we are in the feast times. And I keep thinking, I don't know, when I read Amos 8, I don't know if we're going to be in the time of the season now when we have be in complete darkness. Uh, you know, we're going to have these mega quakes, earthquakes, going to be a time of trouble like we never seen and i think that's what we're heading at so i'm going to go ahead and read daniel because the father gave me daniel to encourage you guys to stand for right to stand for him no matter what okay so let me go ahead and play the short video mute it out again and i'm getting to the bible okay let me go ahead and do that now my husband will be joining me let me go ahead and uh, mute this out again Brothers and sisters, this is Elizabeth Marie with Latter Rain 333, and I come to you in the name of our Lord Jesus. I have a warning dream that I received on September 8th, 2021, that as a watchwoman on the wall, I felt I needed to get this out as soon as possible. Before going to bed that night, before the dream, I asked the Lord specifically if there were any warnings that he wanted me to share. Normally, I don't ask him that, but that night I was really prompted to do that for some reason, uh, prompting of the Holy Spirit. And sure enough, I received a very detailed dream about a huge catastrophe that is coming to the United States. Now, I'm only going to share with you the highlights. In this dream, I was on a mountain resort, and I was in a bedroom, um, and I was on the bed. I was probably about to go to sleep. And I felt an earthquake. My bed rattled. And it really startled me. In the next scene, it's the next morning, I go down to the lobby and I see crowds of people mulling around. And I started asking people, did you feel the earthquake? Did you feel the earthquake? And nobody seemed to notice and nobody really seemed to even care. However, the receptionist at the front desk must have been watching me because she beckoned me over to her, to the front desk. And so I went up to the counter and she leaned over and she quietly told me something in confidence. And what she said shocked me. She said that last night there was an attack on a city. And she said that um, it seemed like this attack was from inside the United States. And I realized that was why I had felt this earthquake, because apparently we weren't too far from the explosion from the city. After she told me this, for some reason I then told her, or I believe I prophesied over it, and I said that I heard that there will be seven more attacks. Now in the next scene, it seemed to be a little bit later in the day, I was outside wandering around the resort um, grounds, watching all the people. By this time, it seemed as if the word had gotten out about the attack in the city. 
because people seemed to be panicking. I saw many of them running to their cars and trying to get in their cars, but the doors would not open. And some of them, I guess, had left the doors open, but the, the cars would not start. It was then that I realized that, the e that there had also been an EMP that had occurred because of the blast. Okay, brothers and sisters, so ob the interpretation is, is um, pretty simple, obviously. Um, the Lord is warning us that there is something that is coming that is very dangerous. It could involve many cities. I believe the seven or eight that I heard in, in my dream only represents that it's going to uh, be probably many cities, not necessarily that seven or eight number. So what I'm asking right now is I'm calling on all the prayer warriors and all the intercessors to be praying against these attacks. You know, the Lord gives us these warnings so we can pray for mercy and pray for these judgments to be lessened or minimized. He is a merciful God. He is long-suffering, not wanting anyone to perish, but instead to come to a full knowledge of him and his son, the Lord Jesus. So I'm asking all of you to be praying right now against this, these attacks and also to be praying for a spirit of repentance to fall upon America. I now want to end with reading to you Jeremiah 6, 16 through 19. Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Also, I set watchmen over you saying, listen to the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. Therefore, hear you nations and know, O know, congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will be certainly bringing calamity on this people, the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words, nor my law, but rejected it. Okay, people, it's true. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to heed. Just like I said in Amos 8 and other chapters I've been reading all uh, summer and fall or whatever it is, fall now. But we're going to get into the Bible now. I'm going to go over here to Daniel. Uh, real important information. If you want to get your Bibles, it'll be good to get your Bibles uh, for Daniel this time, Daniel 6. Um, I like the Amplified, but we might go from back and forth, I don't know, because it really explains it better, you know, uh, in the Amplified. It kind of breaks it down a little more. But my husband, uh, he's going to be reading most of it, uh, so we're going to probably be reading between Amplified. Uh, I don't know if he's going to the Son of Man Bible version, but anyway, Father, be with us as we read your word. Uh, we know a lot of things are going on in the world right now uh, as we are in this feast season. Uh, we know a lot of people are really uh, just not paying attention, just not paying attention, don't want to pay attention. All they think about is partying and having their businesses back where they need to be and making money, making money and buying bitcoins or whatever they want to do, but their mind ain't focused on you. Uh, so we know all these things happening in the world today is for the people to wake up, to wake up. So, Father, help the people to wake up today. Please wake them up. Uh, we know that time is coming to an end. Uh, we ask that your Holy Spirit be with us as we go to Daniel. Uh, help the people hearts to open and get some understanding of what you was trying to say to us from Daniel. Uh, and we thank you so much for your word, Father. We ask it in my name, Yeshua Messiah, so much for your word. Hallelujah. So we're going to go ahead and read from Daniel, and I will be pausing and stopping in between, but uh, it's going to be three key things in Daniel, and I want you to get it as he go along. Standing up against the kings and the rulers of his day, standing up against them, okay, not going along with them. Uh, number two, denying, denying man, not, uh, and praying uh, like he wanted to pray as the father told him to pray. And not uh, walking away, uh, I mean, walking away from all these people. And regard, uh, regardless of what Yeshua wanted to do with him at the time, he was trusting Yeshua no matter what. 
no matter what it was, whether it was bad, whether it was good, he was trusting Yeshua. So you're going to see that all through this reading. Uh, and he was willing to die for Yeshua. That's what I'm saying. But Yeshua stood for him and with him because Daniel stood for Yeshua. That's the key things you got to see here in this, uh, in this chapter. Okay, so go ahead and read. <clears throat> You know, verse first, it pleased Darius to appoint over the kingdom 120 provincial governors who would rule over all the kingdom. Over them there were three chief administrators, and Daniel was one of them. These chief administrators were appointed so that they might supervise the provincial governors, so that the king should suffer no loss. Daniel was distinguished above the other chief administrators and the provincial governors because he had an extraordinary spirit. The king was planning to put him over the whole kingdom. Then the other chief administrators and the provincial governors looked for mistakes in the work Daniel did for the kingdom, but they could find no corruption or failure in his duty because he was faithful. No mistakes or negligence was found in him. Faithful, faithful, trustworthy, okay? He, da Daniel was. Go ahead. Then these men said, We cannot find any reason to complain against this Daniel, unless we find something against him regarding the law of his divine one. Then these administrators and governors brought a plan before the king. They said to him, King Darius, may you live forever. All the chief administrators of the kingdom, the regional governors and the provincial governors, the advisors and the governors have consulted together and decided that you, the king, should issue a decree and should enforce it, so that whoever makes a petition to any deity or man for 30 days, except to you, king, that person must be thrown into the den of lions. Okay, that's why I held my hat on. We are in the den of lions. And I'm t you know what, people? That's what's going on now. We're going to have a decree. We're going to have a law. They're going to change some laws. I don't know if they're going to change the Sunday law. I heard of the Sunday laws as well. But I know they're going to have some laws come before the people. And we gonna, if we don't go uh, for them, they kind of keep uh, putting us in the, like right now, people can't take the, if you know, if you don't take this, they're going to be causing you to do other things, uh, losing your job, losing your home, losing your, uh, I heard a friend of mine told me she haven't had a check in four months from her Social Security, uh, so they're going to be taking away all these things from us eventually if we don't do this, and so it's all, nothing written new under the sun at all. And so they had this back in Daniel's time. They had these laws. They made decrees. And you're going to see what they're going to do here soon. Uh, make a decree that you should worship only that king. And so think about that, what's going on right now before us. Think about it, people. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> now, king, issue a decree and sign the document so that it may not be changed as directed by the laws of the Medes and Persians so it cannot be repealed. So King Darius signed the document, making the decree into a law. When mm -hmm. Daniel learned that the document had been signed into law, he went into his house. Now his windows were open in his upper room toward Jerusalem, and he got down on his knees, as he did three times a day, and prayed and gave thanks before his divine one, as he had done before. Okay, did you see him? Did you see Daniel getting shaky and worried and... Oh, they're going to put me in jail. Oh, they're going to do this to me. They're going to cut my head off. They're going to do... He, 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 stood, he stood on his ordinary, whatever he did ordinarily, whatever he did consistently. He consistently prayed to the Father every day, three times a day. He didn't say, well, he don't care about the rule. He don't care about the laws. He don't care about man-made laws. So we need to get something out of this picture. We need to get something out of Daniel. We need to learn to just stand still and know that I am God. He says, stand still and know that I am God. We should be trusting Yeshua no matter what the system is doing, no matter what the government is doing, no matter what Biden is doing, whatever people, we got to learn to follow our God who made us, who know us, and he will stand with us if we stand with him. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Then these men who had formed the plot together saw Daniel make requests and seek help from the Almighty. Then they approached the king and spoke with him about his decree. Did you not make a decree that everyone who makes a petition to any deity or human during the next 30 days, except to you, king, must be thrown into the den of lions? The king answered, The matter is settled. 
as directed by the law of the Medes and Persians, it cannot be repealed. <laughs> then they replied to the king, That person Daniel, who is one of the people of the exile from Judah, pays no attention to you, king, or to the decree that you have signed. He prays to his divine one three times a day. When the king heard this, he was terribly distressed, and he applied his mind to rescue Daniel from this ruling. He labored until sunset to try to save Daniel. <laughs> then these men who had formed the plot together gathered together with the king and said to him, Know, king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians, that no decree or statute that the king issues can be changed. <laughs> then the king gave an order, and they brought in Daniel, and they threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your divine one, whom you serve continually, rescue you. <laughs> A stone was brought over the entrance to the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Mm -hmm. Then the king went to his palace, and he went through the night fasting. No entertainment was brought before him, and sleep fled from him. So you see what he did? He went and fasted and prayed. That's what Daniel did. He went and fasted and prayed. And I'm just saying, you know, we need to uh, be fasting and praying right now more than ever because... We're going to have the testing time come before us just like Daniel. And are we going to decide to follow the world or follow Yeshua HaMashiach? I'm telling you, people, it's right before us right now. Go ahead. Then at daybreak, the king rose up, and he quickly went to the lion's den. As he came near to the den, he called out to Daniel in a sad voice, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living Almighty, has your divine one, whom you serve continually, been able to save you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, King, live forever. <laughs> My divine one has sent his messenger and has shut the lion's mouths, and they have not hurt me, for I was found blameless before him and also before you, king, and I have done you no harm. Then Hallelujah. the king was very happy. He gave an order that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was lifted up out of the den. No harm was found on him because he had trusted in his divine one. <laughs> The king gave an order, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and threw them into the lion's den. They, their children, and their wives. Wow. Before they reached the floor, the lions overpowered mm -hmm. them and broke all their bones wow. to pieces. Wow. This is what I'm saying. Unbelief. I'm talking in the end of this video about uproot every seed of doubt coming from Maranatha. I'm telling we can't be doubting Yeshua when times come and trouble come. And every time we do, we, we, we do that. I know we do that. People do that. Humans do that. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, God ain't done this, and he ain't coming quick enough, and so I might as well just join these people because I need to eat, and I need to do this, and I need to do that, and my children need to eat. And you better be really knowing who you're going to serve when this testing time come, people. Because, you know, Yeshua said if you love father, mother, brother, sister more than him, you are not worthy of him. You know, it, we don't need to be worrying about that situation. When your testing time come, he will even tell you what to say. And if, you, if he tell you not to say anything, don't say anything. We need to learn to follow the power of Yeshua HaMashiach. Follow him, people. Walk with him. Listen to him. And, and have a relationship. Like I always say, have a relationship with him no matter what you are doing. It don't about a club. It's not about a church. It's not about, oh, how long you've been reading the Bible. If you haven't been born again, I mean born again and really having his power and his Holy Spirit and his DNA inside of you, I'm telling you, these people, that's what they want, your DNA, your DNA. And if you don't want to believe me, I don't know what to tell you, people, but it's time to really get right right now. Go ahead, go ahead, right now. Then King Darius wrote to all the people and ethno-linguistic nations that live in all the earth, May peace increase for you. I hereby make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the mighty one of Daniel, for he is the living Almighty and lives forever, and his kingdom shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall be to the end, <laughs> to the end and beyond, way beyond the end. <laughs> He makes us safe and rescues us, yes. and he does signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Mm -hmm. He has kept Daniel safe from the strength of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, that is, the reign of Cyrus II, the Persian. And that was it. <laughs> Daniel Hallelujah. won. Hallelujah, people. I love that story. You know, we used to read these stories when we was kids coming up, and 
They said that the, the, the lions made a pillow for Daniel's head. He just laid on the lion and went to sleep on the lion. And, you know, and I'm just saying, you know, he trusted in the Father. We got to trust in the Father. I told you guys on my channel many times before that you should be having Father increase your faith in him. Uh, bring things in your life to increase your faith. Because we're going to have to have the faith of Yeshua HaMashiach to get through these times coming. We're going to have to have the faith of Daniel. We're going to have to be dare to be like a Daniel. Dare to be like him. Well, uh, you know, do you have to just go along with everything come your way? Just because they're telling you it's a law in the land and we need to do this. We need to take this. We need to take one, two, three, four, five shots. We need to do this, do that. Do you really need to do it? Do you really need to do it? You need to know who your God is, people. You need to know who Yeshua is because he had warned us about these things coming on the earth at the end, at the end. I'm going to be putting some things in the description box from Apostolic D. I want you to go listen to them. I didn't want to play them on my channel because I don't want my channel clipped right now. So I'm going to put them in the description box, but I want you to listen to what he's saying coming. And we need to be knowing that it's time to be repentant and we're getting our acts together mommy and daddy and sister and brother can't save you nobody can walk on my salvation you can't i can't walk on my husband's salvation he can't walk on mine you're gonna have to stand on your own tub okay so it's time to do that right now and follow yeshua i'm gonna go ahead and end this video because i don't want to i uh, got some other things i got to get going here but i'm gonna go ahead and go to maranatha let me go ahead and go to maranatha and end this video because i'm telling you guys this is what it's going to take no doubting, no doubting, no doubting, no doubting, no doubting. Uproot every seed of doubt. Uproot every seed of doubt. Okay. So let me go ahead and play it right now. Mute it out. February 13. Uproot every seed of doubt. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense and reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. We are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Hebrews 10, 35-39 I saw that we are now in the shaking time. Satan is working with all his power to wrest souls from the hand of Christ, and cause them to trample underfoot the Son of God. Characters being developed. Angels of God are weighing moral worth. God is testing and proving his people. These words were presented to me by the angel. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. God is displeased that any of his people who have known the power of his grace should talk their doubts and by thus doing make themselves a channel for Satan to transmit his suggestions to other minds. A seed of unbelief and evil sown is not readily Rooted up, Satan nourishes it every hour, and it flourishes and becomes strong. A good seed sown needs to be nourished, watered, and tenderly cared for because every poisonous influence is thrown about it to hinder its growth and cause it to die. Satan's efforts are more powerful now than ever before, for he knows that his time to deceive is short. God's people will be sifted, even as corn is sifted in a sieve, until all the chaff is separated from the pure kernels of grain. We are to look to Christ for an example and imitate the humble pattern. I was shown the saint's reward, the immortal inheritance. Then I was shown how much God's people had endured for the truth's sake and that they would count heaven cheap enough. They reckoned that the sufferings of this present time were not worthy to be compared with the glory which should be revealed in them. The people of God in these last days will be tried, but soon their last trial will come, and then they will receive the gift of eternal life. That's right, the gift of eternal life. Those that endure until the end will be saved. That's what that's saying. Those that endure until the end will be saved. So I'm going to go ahead and end the video, people. Um, let me go uh, find, let me see what I'm looking for. 
Uh, I just know that uh, I had to get this video out today. It's so important to get it out to encourage you guys in the Lord, to encourage you in these testing times coming, to encourage you to keep on the upward path uh, and not let no nobody take your crown away from you. Nobody to take your crown away from you. This world ain't worth it. It's not worth it at all. All the trouble, all the problems, all, you know, you're sure going to go and prepare a place for us. He's going to get rid of this world. He's going to have a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, so we need to know that we need to be getting ready, getting ready. Uh, and I want to encourage everybody in the body of Christ to pray for each other. You know, all the videos I listen to, sometimes trying to get information and things like that. And I know I play a lot of uh, different people videos sometimes on my channel. But I'm beginning to see a lot of people on my channel and on videos I listen to that people are bashing each other, just terribly bad, okay, terribly bad, and you know, I'm not, I don't live in your household, you don't live in mine, you don't know what really goes on in my household, only the things you see me, that I want you to see, <laughs> but you know, I'm just saying, as, a, as an example, in other people's households, I don't know what go on there, and so people just bashing one another, and talking about one another, oh, she's a witch, and she's not a true child of God, and oh, we shouldn't listen to her, and oh, that person over there in that church doing so and so, and you know, guys, we need to stop, we need to stop, I mean, I was, I was just thinking about that yesterday, you know, I, I heard this so many times. Oh, yeah, Betty, this is, she's a witch, and oh, this person is a witch. And, you know, do you really know who people are? Do you, God, do you, have you made that person? Do you know their heart? Do you know what they're thinking? You sure only know these things. So we need to pray for one another, not judging one another, helping one another. He, you know, when the time of trouble hit, we're we going to have so many troubles coming our way. You, you don't know who may be able to help you out. We were looking at this movie, uh, what Carrie Corey Ten Boom? What, what's her name? Corey Ten Boom. Mm -hmm. uh, her movie, and how she had the Jews helping the Jews out, and you don't know who's gonna help you out in the times of trouble. You don't know where your fought, wood, your your water gonna come from and your food gonna come from. And maybe your enemy, the one you used to bash all the time, could help you. And so we need to be understanding how important it is to pray for one another because that's what Yeshua said to do. You know, I don't like a lot of people either. Their attitudes stink. They really do some people. But you know, he told me to pray. I have people in my family I can't stand, okay? And I have to pray for them regardless because that's what he told us to do, to pray for one another. Pray for those that spitefully use you, persecute you, say all manner of evil against you. All these things we need to keep it in mind that we need to pray for each other. So I just wanted to put that out there. And I want to thank you guys for all your offerings to help the homeless, the orphans, the widows, and those that need a mission fields. May Yahuwah richly bless each and every one of you. Uh, our donation options are very, uh, we have quite a few here, three of them. Uh, donation options at Tyler App. Uh, you can go also to uh, Cash App, and then we have one at the bump card at HTTPS colon slash slash Gina Marner dot the bump card dot me. And so you can go to uh, donation options here at our website as well at fmcmi.org. Uh, you can go to marner.com at gmail.com at PayPal. Uh, you can either mail in your donations at Fill My Cup Ministries, Post Office Box 414, Canyon City, Colorado, 81215. Uh, you can ship things to us at Fill My Cup Ministries, 1501 Main Street, number 414, Canyon City, Colorado, 81212. So uh, I'm going to uh, thank you guys so much, and I'm going to have my husband in with prayer. But I tell you, trumpets is coming again. Uh, this is a trumpets month, I guess. Uh, different times and all that, but uh, it's trumpets month. We got other feasts Friday, coming. Sure. Friday uh, coming. Uh, the whole world will wander after the beast system. Uh, we asking you not to do it. So we're just going to go ahead and pray now and let uh, my husband close us out. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to share your word. <laughs> Father, what you're doing on this planet today. We just thank you that you reign over all. Mm -hmm. And we just ask you to quickly send and soon send Yeshua to overcome this planet mm -hmm. and take over the kingdoms of this world and establish your kingdom here and now in Jerusalem. And we thank mm -hmm. you for doing that. We thank you for everyone that we get to pray for and people that pray for us and support us. Father, we thank you for each person that gets to view the videos. We love you, Father. We give you all the glory. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. I have a testimony for I end, a real quick one. Uh, I just heard word from uh, Jim Ford over in Arkansas. You know, we have been praying for him because his house had been burnt down by uh, arsonists. Uh, they found the arsonists, uh, a couple, 
Uh, they are in jail right now. And also he got his car back because when he moved to the hotel, someone stole his vehicle. God, God brought his car back. No damage, no damage done, people. And so prayer is working in this. I tell you guys, prayers are working. And then we had another lady call me the other day and say she went in to do a uh, check for cancer. She had nothing that was shown. Uh, and we just having all these, uh, we had a lady in South Carolina. Uh, God had, we, I told you to pray over a lady named Wendy in South Carolina. And she is saying, God has been recovering her. She don't have the pains and aches anymore. But I told you guys to lift her up. So I'm telling you, if you've got a prayer request, just send it in. And I was sending it out to the prayer warriors. And they would pray with me and pray with you. Because I'm telling you, prayer is, is powerful, people. Use prayer. It's powerful. Trust in the Father that made you. Mm -hmm. So you guys have a wonderful, wonderful uh, weekend, uh, week, the rest of the weekend, uh, rest of the week. And please, uh, please pray without ceasing. And please give your life to Messiah Yeshua, that he can save you. And I mm -hmm. thank you, and I ask you that you come again for another video. We're going to go now. Shalom, shalom. I love you guys so much. All right. Bye-bye, folks. Shalom, shalom. Mm -hmm. <laughs>